Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Aliza Ben Shalom with Marriage Minded Mentor, and we are so excited to have you here tonight. We are going to explore emotional intimacy. We're going to dig into that topic pretty deep, deeply, and get through some Q&A, figure it out, uh, and then we're going to open up the floor to anybody who's on with us live. Um, also, anybody is welcome to always watch this recording and send it to their friends as well. We would love to connect with new friends. So we would like tonight, in addition to welcoming you, to say thank you so much to, to Adopt a Shadchan, who is sponsoring tonight's webinar. Adopt a Shadchan is a wonderful nonprofit organization that supports singles. They work out of New York. And if you go to uh, adoptashadchan.com, you will find out all about the programs and the things that they are doing. They are now doing Zoom calls and Zoom breakout rooms with chats. They're bringing hundreds of singles together to get to know each other. Already one couple um, got engaged. Mazel tov. That's awesome. Isn't that phenomenal? Yeah, yeah through quarantine and all. Yep. That's amazing. So, um, and there's tons of, of uh, people that are dating uh, because they met through Adapt to Shadchan. And um, a lot of those, you know, I've been working with some of those um, singles and they said that there are really quality people that are on there. So I totally encourage you to check that out if it's the right crowd for you. Also, just so everybody knows, we have all sorts of people on our webinar. We have older singles, we have younger singles, we have religious singles, we have secular singles and everything in between. And so it doesn't matter who you are and where you come from, whether you're from the States or from Israel or from Belgium or from South America or South Africa or Australia, welcome. We are so, so happy to have you. Okay, you ready, Sarah, you ready? Ready. <laughs> okay, so I've got my notes right here, here we go. Um, okay, emotional intimacy. So. When we're talking about intimacy, I like to break the word down like this, and perhaps you've all heard of this before. Intimacy, you can also think of it as in, to, me, see. Intimacy, but into, me, see, right? You, when you see into me, when you look into me, that's how we start to develop intimacy and vice versa. Now, if I'm doing some pretty heavy blocking language or behavior in order to prevent you from looking into me, then you're going to have a hard time developing something with me. Even if you're good at developing intimacy, if I'm putting up some pretty strong negative or blocking emotions, you're not going to be able to break through. So it, it is something where it takes two to tango, but if you're not great at opening up and the other person is better, they might be able to draw you out. But what I don't want you to do is to count on somebody to do that for you because it's really difficult for the other person. The other person struggles when they're trying to pull something out of you. It's like yanking teeth. They're like, it just doesn't come out. Like, just say it. Let's connect. You've got to show up. So that is just an overall, um, you know, digging into intimacy. That's just like a little bit of um, setting the stage for it. So don't wait for somebody to draw you out. Work on getting comfortable with vulnerability, and we're going to talk about how to do that. We're going to talk about how to take an average date and make it a personal date or an interpersonal date. We are going to talk about connection, understanding, being on the same page, talking about the way that you think, and building this deeper level of connection. And we are also going to talk a little bit about what happens if you're reserved or you're guarded or you're not feeling so personable or so warm. How do you develop some of those tools and skills to connect with other people? I was working with a client recently and we were talking about emotional intimacy. And she said, I asked her first, I said, do you have trouble opening up to friends or family or other people? And she said, no, not usually. I said, okay, picture one person in your life. Everybody can do this along with me right now. Picture one person in your life that you feel very comfortable with. Take a moment, close your eyes. Who is one person that you feel that you have an emotional intimacy with? Could be a friend. It could be a family member. It could be a mentor, somebody you're close with. You got that person? You're holding on to it? You know who it is? Okay. Now I asked her, why are you open and comfortable with this person? You have emotional intimacy with them. You have the ability to build emotional intimacy. What is it about them or about your relationship with them that makes it possible to have this? 
So here's what my client said. She said, this person that I'm thinking of, nothing phases her and I can just be open. I can share my mind. This other person validates my feelings. They validate what they hear. They, I, I, they know what I'm saying. They get me. I feel heard. I feel understood. And I feel seen when I'm with them. If we could only do that for everybody in our lives, we would have so much emotional intimacy. So when you think, and, and you know what, let's take a minute while we're comment, we're, while we're talking about this for anybody to comment in the chat box, this person that you're thinking of, what is it that makes you comfortable enough to be emotionally intimate with them? What do they do for you or when they're with you? Put some thoughts in the chat box and then Sarah's going to read them out for us as they come in and we're going to talk about them. All right. We got some answers. Um, they still love me even though I'm crazy and act silly. Love it. Uh, Non-judgmental vibes. I feel accepted, heard, and safe. Keep them coming. Okay, great. They're supportive no matter what. They listen and they don't stress me out. <laughs> That's a good one. A good one. <laughs> <laughs> um, they push each other unconsciously. Okay. They understand me fully and listen and care about me. Okay, great. It's a beautiful list. So one of the things that we have a challenge with, with all of those things that you mentioned and what I mentioned is that how do you get that in the beginning of a relationship? On a first date, on a second date, on a third date, Elise, are you telling me I have to have all of these things to feel safe and comfortable? Usually with friends or family members, we have time. We have time to adjust. We have time to get used to them. We have time to build this relationship. And when we're talking about dating, especially in the beginning of dating, emotional intimacy, like what, on a first date, you want me to be friendly and connected and emotionally available to you? I don't even know you. I don't know if I like you. I don't know if I trust you. I don't know if you're going to be there to listen, to get me. I don't know any of this. So to build it seems like it's something that's really difficult. So we're going to dig into that. And I also want to dig into the other side. And the other side is fear of intimacy. And we all have an amount of a fear of intimacy. So you might fear intimacy because... You just, you, you like to hold off until you get to know somebody and build a relationship. It takes you a little bit longer. It just might be um, your thing. You might fear intimacy, um, maybe that you, you had some abandonment issues. Maybe somebody very close to you once pulled away or left you, or you had a bad experience that left a negative taste in your mouth, and now you fear building something again because you don't want that to happen again. You might have, which goes along with fear of rejection, right? Like, oh, I did this before. I opened up and you know what happened as soon as I opened up? Yeah, it never worked out. And they walked out every single time. And every time I have to bear my soul and I have to connect with everybody. And then it just never works out. So I have a fear of rejection. Other people, it's a little bit more about control. They want to control the relationship. And so I'm going to open up when I'm ready to open up. I'm not going to do it on your time. I'm not going to do it just because I should. I just... I have to keep a tight control on me, on my emotions, and on our connection. Um, and for some people, um, it's, it runs very, very deep. And it can be something that is related to a past um, abuse or very negative situation that they experienced, some sort of um, trauma that they went through. So fear of intimacy is something that we all have to a degree, whether it's to the degree of two or five or 10, we all have our own fears of intimacy. And you could take a minute right now, if we were to give you a scale, one to 10, you know, one being, ah, I don't really think so, not at all. And 10 being, yeah, I really have a, a fear of intimacy. This is, there's something that's really holding me back, whether you know what it is or you don't. Think about where you rate on the scale. I'm not gonna ask you to post it. But just take a moment, where, where am I on the scale of fear of intimacy? With a relationship with a potential partner. We're not talking about parents or friends or anybody else in your life. We're talking about with a potential mate. For most people, it's, it's a fairly high number. It's not, it's not you know, usually a one or a two. It's usually gonna be somewhere between a four to a, an eight 
in that range. It's really difficult. Okay, so let's talk about different types of intimacy. And I did a little bit of um, a little bit of research on this and came up with four different categories to talk about intimacy. There is, um, of course, the hot topic, which everybody thinks when they think of intimacy, what do we think of? We think of sexual intimacy. That's not what we're going to be talking about tonight. That is a level that we would talk about or get to when we're in the relationship for marriage. What I want to talk about is one of three things, intellectual intimacy, emotional intimacy, or experiential intimacy. And think about yourself for a minute and think about which category you fit into more or you more like to fit into. Sarah, I see a smile on your face. Talk to me. What do you think? Intellectual <laughs> intimacy. <laughs> okay. It's always how I connected with my dates. Always. And <laughs> I need the P P.S. What's the end of the story? <laughs> P.S. Um, I went with the, the emotional intimacy was always lacking and my fiance, we, yeah, right off the bat connected on that emotional intimacy. And I, I don't really get the intellectual intimacy from him so much. And I realized it's not really what I need. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to throw off what you're going to talk about, but <laughs> <laughs> there are other story. people in my life who fill that role. Um, and the emotional intimacy was really, really so much more important to a relationship. Right. And what I love about your story is that you thought for a very long time, I need intellectual intimacy. I need it. I need it. Without it, this relationship is not going to work. And you're not the only client that I've had like this. I have many clients like this and they look for the intellectual data and they find the intellectual data and they get the intellectual intimacy and then they don't get the emotional intimacy. And they're always telling me, but it's lacking and it's out of balance. And I said, great. Well, one is going to always be stronger. Which one do you want to be stronger? And they tell me exactly what you said. Which is, <laughs> I thought it was going to be this, this way. And really it's that way. I can't believe it. I thought it was intellectual intimacy that I needed. And actually I realized it's emotional intimacy. Um, maybe just tell us a little bit more, like how did you move through it and how long did it take you to get over this? Cause it wasn't like, it wasn't like, Oh, we just had a conversation or a webinar yeah. and like, poof, it happened. Yeah. Um, I mean, again, the number one thing on my list of what I wanted in a life partner was like the, the bottom line was someone who is going to have my back no matter what. And that I feel like even if I completely fall apart, uh, fall apart, he'll be with me until I'm ready to pick up the pieces and then help me pick up the pieces. That was bottom line what I needed, but I connected. I should really, the truth is I connected with people and I was attracted to people on an intellectual level. So whether it was at a Shabbos meal, a guy that I met or someone setting me up and we, and us going out on a date, um, the intellectual piece is what pulled me in. And in all of those situations, the emotional piece was missing. And so more than once, like we ended up being really good friends and keeping in touch for a while afterwards, but there was no emotional connection that led to something deeper than just a really deep conversation on an intellectual level. And so when I met Shia, I mean, it's... <laughs> It sounds so dumb and so cliche because like, I, I still feel like this doesn't happen in real life, but there was just a comfort that I felt just literally the first time that, you know, I sat next to him and I was just like, we spoke for hours and I was just like, this feels nice. And it was an we, emotional, an emotional yeah. comfort is what you're yeah. talking and about. And just, just so like we clear up how not intellectual it was, we didn't speak the same language. We could not have a deep intellectual conversation. It took me a really long time to figure out that he's actually really smart. I just assumed he wasn't because we couldn't like even get intellectually deep. Um, but there was just this emotional bit that was there. And when we spoke about it, you actually, like the bottom line was the intellectual part was really nice and I thought I needed it. Um, but I realized that I couldn't do without the emotional intimacy. And so now that I had the emotional intimacy, it was time to explore whether that would be enough to make a relationship work, even if the intellectual part wasn't there. 
and it was. Amazing. It's, a, it's not a unique story, although it feels unique. It happens more often than you think. And I've seen people go one of two ways. They either go for that emotional intimacy and they choose it and they, because exactly what you described, they just felt good, safe, comfortable, comforted, connected in the moment with somebody and they wanted to spend their life with somebody like that. And I've also seen people go the other way and say, you know what, I'm going to have to give up on that and not have such a strong emotional component, but we really have this intellectual intimacy, this connection. We get each other at this super deep level. And it's, it, it's just something that's happening that I'm going to have to be okay. And the emotional side, it will have to be enough because this side is so calming and soothing to my brain. In the same way, what you started to feel in your heart other people feel in their, their brain. And it's like, I describe it like this. It's like a massage for the brain. When you talk to somebody, right? With emotional, with intellectual intimacy, intellectual intimacy is like a massage for your brain. Emotional intimacy is a massage for your heart. And if we're talking about experiential intimacy, it's a massage for your whole body. It's, it's, you're totally immersed in it when you love to do the same things like people that connect over hobbies and interests and they just they like they do stuff together you see those couples they're always doing stuff together they have the same things in common they love it and they they just hit it off and you're like wow now they still have an emotional connection they still have an intellectual connection to a degree but the one that they have to the highest degree is the experiential connection that when they are together they feel great and they love doing what they're doing when they're together so what we need to dig into a little bit is uh, the practical tips and tools and things about building intimacy, no matter what category it is, we need to have some ways of experiencing this, doing this and, and knowing what's happening. So first of all, in terms of intimacy, don't be afraid to mess up. I don't care, mess up, just make an effort. If you're not making an effort because you're too afraid, you have to read a book which is called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. It's by a woman called Susan, named Susan Jeffers, J-E-F-F-E-R-S, and it's fabulous. And it just talks about fear in general, not specifically this type of fear. But if you're having an amount of fear, you need to move through the fear. But don't be afraid to try something. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is, yeah. Um, so I think we're just having some people pop on now. Can you just, um, did you give a definition of emotional intimacy? And if you did, can you repeat it? If you didn't, can you just give a brief overview? Okay, hold on. Let me scroll back up to my notes. Thanks. Uh, wait, can you also just welcome them and explain what happened for a minute while I left? Yes. Yes. So to everyone who just joined in the last few minutes, um, the flyer said eight o'clock and we planned it for eight o'clock like we have for the last 12 webinars that we've done. And somehow there was a glitch on the Zoom proper. And I believe that an email went out saying that it was at 830. So I apologize, but the good news is that you will get a replay on Sunday, God willing. So if you miss anything up until this point, don't worry, you'll be able to watch it um, and get all of the information. Okay, and the 30 second overview of um, exploring ult emotional intimacy, what we first started talking about, which is the breakdown of the word intimacy and talking about it as in to me see, right? When you look into me, you see into me. When I look into you, I see into you. I get you, I understand you, I hear you, I connect with you, I validate what you're saying then we can build a relationship and we can build a deeper bond, a connection and have what we're calling intimacy. We also quickly just came up with three different categories of intimacy. We talked about experiential intimacy, emotional intimacy, and intellectual intimacy. Okay, we're going to continue on. Thank you. And sorry for anybody who came, who came on time, but didn't know of anything. <laughs> and it's not really the time. Okay, so here's what we want to do. I want to get into the practical tools of intimacy. And Sorry, give you I cut few... you off. You were in the middle of yeah. saying number two. Number two of something. I think. Okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to repeat number one. So number one is in terms of sharing information. Don't be afraid to mess up in terms of building intimacy. Don't be afraid and just not do something because you 
you just can't do it. Work on your fear, work on getting over it, moving through it slowly, consistently as dating progresses and, and work yourself through it. You're good. It's okay to mess up. I mess up all the time. And I just try again the next day. And I pray that my friends, my family members, and the people that I know and work with and connect to when I mess up, I acknowledge it and I move on and we can still build a relationship. And that mess up can even be more glue to stick us together even stronger. Number two was that um, information needs to be more personal, not heavier. Okay? Personal not heavy. So personal means I want to tell you about me. When I'm building intimacy, when I'm building a connection, I need to tell you about me. I am not laying on my deepest, darkest secrets, the heavy, the schmutz. You wouldn't believe what happened when I was seven. Am I, da, da, and they're like, I'm not telling you about the most horrible things or heavy things or awful things. That's not intimacy. That is, what do we call that? That is just venting. That is just getting it out. That is just raw, honest, real. Yeah, okay, we're going to be honest, we're going to be real. But in terms of intimacy, we're going to build something special, unique, something different. And we're going to do that by being personal, personal stories. We're going to talk about things that are important to me, that matter to me. I, when I talk to people, I want to know you. I want to know what matters to you. How you and I are similar, I want to know that. How you and I are different, I want to know that. What your opinion is, I want to know that. It doesn't matter where we fall on the spectrum, if we're alike or we're not alike. It matters that I get to know you, I understand you, I connect with you. That means something to me, that's important to me. Okay, the third thing um, in this category is, no, we did deep personal but not heavy. Oh, it's this, actually, it's, it's really only two and a half because I wrote um, deep is good, just like heavy. So deep is good. But it's not, if it's not personal, it doesn't matter that it's deep. So if the subject is a deep conversation and you're talking about the meaning of life, psh, whoa, that's so deep. But if you're just talking about it in theory and I don't know your personal opinion on it or where you fall, it's not personal. It's not intimate. It's not like I get to know you any better. I really want to know your thoughts about it. I want to know what you're thinking, what you're feeling, what's going on, what your experience is of it. And then if there's going to be an intimate moment that happens. So in terms of dating tools, we're going to break this down for dates one, one and two, or one, two, and three. It's a little fuzzy here. And then we're going to talk about four, five, and six. And then we're going to talk about seven and beyond. So dates one, two, or three, how do we build intimacy? One tool, eye contact. You've got to use them. You know, the eyes are the windows to the soul. They really are. When you look at me and I look at you and you see me, seeing me is the first thing that you have to do. Really seeing me, getting me, knowing me, understanding me, that comes later. But if you're not looking at me, there's a physical sign in this world that you could see me. If you can't see me or you're not looking at me, then, then we might have a challenge. Um, if anybody is in a situation where you either A, don't see so well or, ha or visually are impaired, you want to look in the direction of somebody, even if you're not able to physically see them. You want to be just, I, if you're not going to be eye to eye, what I want you to be is heart to heart. Okay, so there's another way of looking at each other. We can look at each other with our eyes, but we also look with our hearts. That means body language. I am facing you. If I was sitting like this towards the camera, my body's over here. I'm really having a conversation over here. I don't, even if I'm turning my head to talk to you and I'm looking at you, you get the impression I'm cutting you off here visually. Okay, so if I'm going to see you, we've got to be eye to eye and we need to be heart to heart in order for us to connect. Sorry, were you going to say something? <laughs> oh, right, I like that. I like that a lot. Okay, great. Um, the second piece of it is smiling and laughing. Okay, so we've got our eyes, we've got our heart engaged. Now we have to have our smile and we've got to have our voice engaged. And so a smile on your face in terms of intimacy means you are happy to see me. You're happy to be here with me, right? It could also just mean you're a happy person. And you might do that with everybody. I might not know the difference, but I'm going to feel really great if you smile when you're looking at me. It's going to make me feel good. I'm going to feel connected to you. And if I feel good and I feel connected to you, then we are going to have intimacy. We are going to have a level of connection that we don't have with everybody in the world. We're going to take something and take it deeper and take it further. Lisa, um, yeah, tell me. How do you achieve this kind of intimacy if you're having a phone conversation? 
Ooh, right. Because you can't be eye to eye and you can't be heart to heart and they cannot see your smile. So you should laugh the whole time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, you can totally hear a smile. Okay. So that's really true. It's funny. I have told my clients that um, I tell them to say something. I'm like, okay, now smile because you weren't smiling when you said that. And they laugh. They're like, how'd you know? And I said, because yeah. I can hear a smile. So if you actually smile when you talk on the phone, people can hear it. So it's true. On a phone conversation, the way that I like to do it is through tone, through intonation. So first of all, you don't want to have a monotone voice where you're talking like this the whole time. You want to have a little bit more of... <laughs> Thanks for my ro robotic answer. Um, so you, you want to vary your tone. So there's, there's two things. There's tone, what you're saying, high pitch, low pitch, how you're saying it, and also seed. You want intimacy? It goes like this. You can lower the tone of your voice. You talk a little bit slower. If you see, like you could see me, I'm leaning in, but if you didn't see me leaning in, you might imagine that I was leaning into this conversation. Yeah. That builds intimacy, right? Even your, yeah, that was softer, right? Ooh, now there's a moment. It's almost, you're not whispering, but it's almost like somebody's right there in the next room and you want to talk loud enough that the person on the phone can hear you, but soft enough that there's it's this conversation between us. You see, right? And what's the difference? This is the difference. This is Aliza just talking regular, having a conversation with you. It doesn't feel as intimate. It doesn't feel as personal. It doesn't feel as close. Why? Oh, this is, this is the stage Aliza, right? This is the intimate Aliza. It happens like that in a blink of an eye in a moment with your tone. It's really interesting because if you think about it, I'm trying to think of the conversations on dates that I've had where the transition from, you know, me talking about going to camp in Russia versus me talking about my parents' divorce, there's a difference in the sound. Like you do, you really go from, oh my gosh, it was amazing to do this volunteer work to like, yeah, that, you know, that's my life right now, <laughs> you know? Um, right. you, you, do, you do that even when you're in person. Right, right, there's a, there's a moment, there's almost a hesitation and a pause before you're speaking without even intentionally meaning to yeah. do it. Yeah. It's like, I'm about to tell you something that I don't just tell everybody. Right. Another thing with intimacy, and this would be more, toward, it could be on a first date, a second date, or a third date. The topics are going to vary. But when somebody is talking about something, you're paying attention. And then when you respond, you connect to them in a way where you show them, oh, you know what? If I was in your shoes, I probably would have done the same thing right? Oh, you connected to me. I said I did this. You said you would have done that. We now have something in common that builds intimacy, that builds a closeness, that builds a connection. Or you did this. I did this too. I, you were a lifeguard at summer camp. Me too. Where did you go to camp? What did you do? Oh my gosh. What about your, oh, did you, do you have to go through the whole thing and the tests and then, and then the kids and oh my gosh. Right? And all of a sudden we have intimacy. Why? We, we had the same experience, but it was a different experience, but it was similar enough that you and I have something going on. We have this connection that I don't have with everybody because not everybody was a lifeguard at summer camp, but you and I were, and we had that moment. By the way, that's a real client story. That was like the, one of the first, th yeah, that was one of the first things that they bonded over. And they're like, Aliza, how did you know that this was going to be such a good match and this was going to work out? And, and I was like, look, I had no idea about summer camp. That was just luck, you know? <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> they did get married. Uh, it was not only because they went to summer camp together. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so if we're talking about dates one, two, and three, again, you're going to keep this on the lighter side here, but you can also identify what you admire in somebody else. So if they tell you about something that they did or a story or something, identify something about them, about that experience. Like, wow, oh, you, you, that was brave of you to do that, right? Oh, you complimented them in a way that boosted them up, that shows them that you get them, you understand them, and you respect them in a certain way, that you see something about them. So if you can identify what you admire in somebody else, it helps you to build this relationship that takes it from you're just somebody to me or nobody to me to you and I really have a close connection. Um, okay, two more things. Mindset, okay? You need to have a mindset of 
what would I do to make you become my best friend? If I wanted to be best friends with you, what would I be doing to build this relationship? When I do building this relationship, <laughs> so I saw a comment. <laughs> I, I just saw a comment that came into the chat box. Someone's like, I watch Lisa Ben Shalom's webinar. Oh, really? Me too. I love them. <laughs> That's what they're buying for. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> That's great. I said it to Southern, the Lisa show. Here we go. <laughs> um, okay. So um, the mindset of being best friends, right? If, if I have a mindset of, I, I had, by the way, I had a girlfriend once who we weren't friends at first. We just met, we met somewhere and we had a nice connection. She had a mindset that I was going to be her best friend. I didn't know this. This was just her thing. She decided, my, I found you. I like you. You will be my best friend. She hunted me down. She emotionally built connections. I'm telling you, like, we're still best friends because she wanted something. Because she had a mindset of, I'm going to build a relationship with you and I'm going to put my effort into it. So in terms of a romantic relationship, if you think of it like a regular friendship, best friendship, what would you do to build that? How do you make somebody your best friend? It doesn't just happen. You think it just happens. You might feel like it just happens. It doesn't just happen. We find things in common. We hang out. We build each other up. We support each other, right? If I'm doing all of those things, I'm building emotional intimacy. Now, again, in dates one, two, two and three, it's very light, but I am still making an effort to boost you, to build you up, to connect with you, to hang on, not to rope you in, but to draw us closer together, more, more like a magnetic drawing us in together. Aliza, yeah, I don't know if I told you this, but on our third date, our, our third time we hung out, because <laughs> we weren't <laughs> officially dating, um, he actually said to me, he's, the time where he said, um, I love you, which I shared this story a, a little while ago, so for anyone who wasn't there, it was in Hebrew, and there's no differentiation between I like you and I love you, and he meant to say I like you, um, <laughs> but he said, I was like, wait, what is, when I asked him to define, like, what does that mean, because I was like, why are you saying you love me, um, he was just like, I just, I want to be your best friend. And I was like, that's so weird. I didn't say that obviously, but I'm like, I don't, who is this guy? I'm like, why is he saying that? <laughs> again, like I'm super brainy and intellectual and I don't know. That's not, that's like a very feely thing to say. And I was just like, how do you know? <laughs> we don't even know each other yet, <laughs> but there was this emotional connection. And so it's funny because I'm just thinking about it now. I was really the one who was ready to get engaged like way quicker than he was. But I think in the back of his head, he always had this, I want to, he always had this, I want to marry my best friend kind of mindset, which for me was a dream. And I had been told so many times not to dream it. <laughs> um, but I like, now I'm wondering how much of the fact that he eventually got there and it wasn't that long, but you know, was in his head because he knew that he wanted to be my best right. friend. And he made you his best friend he did. and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> See, it worked. <laughs> it worked. Um, okay. So the mindset to be your best friend. And the last thing in this category of dates one, two, and three is just get curious. Anybody know the book about Curious George? He was curious about everything. And he like monkeyed around and all sorts of things. And he always got into trouble. But we're not going to get into trouble. We're going to get a, into a good kind of trouble. We're going to get into an emotional intimacy connection. I like you. I want to get to know you. Even if I don't know if I want to marry you, by the way, dates one, two, and three, I don't care if you want to marry them. You just want to try to make them your best friend, get connected, build a relationship, see if something is there, get curious about them. Who are they and what are they about and what do they think and how do they feel and what do they want to do and just learn, get super, super curious about somebody. That's dates one, two, and three. Dates four, five, and six. Now this is like ish, right? Um, we are going to talk a little bit more about a verbal intimacy. Okay, so we're going to talk about using the person's name. So you might just normally say hi and how are you and all these things, right? And you're not like, oh, hi, Joe. How are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. Oh, Joe, you're so funny. I love that joke, right? We don't use people's names. If you notice, you will notice now that I'm telling you. You will see this everywhere. You don't see people's names. And you're like, yeah. why don't I see people's names? Unless you're one of those people that do. Wait, by the way, if you're one of those over name users where every other word, oh, like Aliza and, okay, Aliza. And what about this? Aliza and Aliza and Aliza. Blah, blah, blah. Don't be an over user of a name, just a normal user. When you meet somebody in person for the, or virtually, hi, hi, Joe, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. Good. Maybe use their name once in the middle or twice in the middle of the conversation, maybe once at the end. If you don't want to do it that much, even 
bookends, one in the middle and one at the end. One name drop and one name drop. The most beautiful sound to anybody's ears is the sound of their own name. People love hearing it. And not just hearing it, but by you actually saying it, I feel more connected to you because you yeah. called my name. What's that song? You just call out my name and you know wherever I am? No. I'll come running to see you again. Winter, spring, summer, or fall? <laughs> you don't know the song. I, I have no idea what you're sorry. talking about, but I really like this. And I noticed <laughs> for myself in the past when I, I, for me, it was like a level to like call them by their first name. If I didn't feel it, I wasn't, I don't care how many times someone got it. I, I don't <laughs> care how many times, you know, you call me by my name. I'm not going to call you by my name until I get there. And one guy actually called me out for it. He's like, you never say my name. Um, yeah. Do you know, wait, do you know why you didn't do it? I know why you didn't do it. Cause you didn't want to build an emotional right. connection right. with him. You knew it. You didn't, you subconsciously knew once I it wasn't name, even subconscious. I consciously knew it. <laughs> and the more he did that, I was like, hold on, let's, we got to go with my pace here. Um, but yeah, right. and so I'm, true. I'm I didn't, I didn't want to, that's true. And on the flip side, the I remember when I was in seminary, leaving seminary, and so this is 10 years ago, someone, one of my roommates gave me a card, and in the card she wrote my name. Like, besides the dear Sarah, she was giving me a compliment, and she said, Sarah, you're blah, 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 blah. And I was, I was just like, whoa, that felt so much more personal. And it was a card addressed to me, but the fact that she put my name in a paragraph, which most people don't do. I totally started doing that after that because I was like, it really makes a difference. It just feels so much more personal and intimate. Right. Right. Just by a name, a name. What's in a name? You know that reference? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not talking to you. References. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, mm, mm, mm. okay. Number two in terms of dates four to six. So we talked a little bit about this name and verbal intimacy. Now I want to talk about a physical intimacy, but not that kind of physical intimacy, but right. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Thank you. My audience knows. Okay. So, um, what do you know about this other person and what little small gift or little token something could you give? Okay, so we're not talking about physical intimacy between two people. We're talking about a physical gift, a token, a little something that says, I get you. I know what you like, right? If you had a best friend and it was their birthday, you would want to send them something, but it's their friend and it's their birthday. No, 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 this is just a date. And you're not just going to buy a flower or you're not just, not, nothing generic. You buy me a flower. I'm like, oh, thanks. Nice. Flower. You think of me, you may be like me, but you don't know me. You know I like, I'm looking for something. I don't know, I'm just going to grab my water bottle. Here, right? Oh, well, okay, fine. If you buy flowers and you know my favorite flower is a sunflower, which it is, and you buy me sunflowers, then I'm going to be crazy happy because it's sunflowers. But if you buy Your me tulips, lit up. <laughs> it's true because I love sunflowers. Do you know I have 50 in my garden? Maybe less because a few died, but... If you, if you just buy me tulips, I'm going to be like, oh, nice gift. Thanks. You bought me tulips. You buy me flowers. I'm going to be like, yeah, sunflowers. sunflowers, right? Okay. Or if you know that I love having my water bottles, you know, and I needed a new one and you buy me my new large 20 ounce water bottle. I'm so excited because you knew it was something I wanted or needed. It doesn't need to be a personal, deeply intimate gift. I just need it to be that you know me, you know what I like, you know what I need, you know what I want, or what would make me smile. If you know what would make me smile, if I, if I like chocolate, which I don't love chocolate, but if I like chocolate and you know my favorite kind was a chocolate raspberry truffle, does that exist? But if it does and you bought it for me, <laughs> then I would be so happy, right? But if you buy me chocolate raspberry truffles and I don't really like chocolate, it's like nice. It's like, Oh, thank you. Nice gesture. Right. 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 Doesn't feel so personal. My earbuds keep falling out. Okay. Okay. So there we go. Um, that, okay. So we've got the person's name. We've got a little gift, token gift you could give them. This is on dates four to six, taking intimacy to the next level. The last thing 
is identifying verbally what you know about them, these virtues, these traits, these something. So Sarah, if if we're not dating, we're going to just use a friend example, right? If I know you and we're friends and I want to build our relationship and I want to tell you, you know, bring it on. <laughs> I'm listening. If I want to tell you, Sarah, I love that you are so organized and you pull things together and they look great. You really know how to just make it Shazam. Everything sparkles when you put it out there. It just, it hits the spot every time. Okay. If I tell you that, right? <laughs> I feel warm and fuzzy. <laughs> right? You're soaking it up. So on a date, let's give an example, Sarah. Do we have an example of on a date, what that would look like? Just even a virtue, even, even to know, I'll give you an example, driving, right? You're, maybe you're in a car together, even though it's COVID time and you have your mask <laughs> on and you're in the car together and you're sitting next to each other and the person, you know, stops and whatever. And they're like, no, no, you go, you go. And you're like, oh, you know, like it's so nice to be in a car with a really conscientious, thoughtful driver. Like what, how refreshing. Yeah. You just complimented on, I feel great. I feel so connected. Like, yeah, that's me. That is me. I am a, like, I'm not do doing this for show just for you. Like, that's really who I am. You saw a glimpse of me. Uh, this is, this goes under the category of when you see it, say it, right? When you yeah. see it, when you see something, say something share with somebody what you are noticing. It's like a notice note. Wait, you got to write that down. Lana's on here and she's going to write it down for us. But when you see it, say it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Seven, date seven plus, and then we're going to move on to the Q and A. Okay. So, um, okay. Okay, so I know you and I get you and I understand you and that makes me feel good when you understand me. So um, one thing is expressing gratitude to somebody, but not thanks so much for my gift. Thanks so much for being so thoughtful, right? Thanks for thinking of me and, and going out of your way to do something for me, right? Don't compliment the thing compliment the person, compliment the behavior, okay? We want to let them know how much we appreciate them and we want to know them to know what they did that we appreciate, not what that, not what we received, but what they did for us. It's so funny because um, I was just going to say with the naming the behavior before, um, yeah. it sounds so self-serving, but I noticed that the more you name a behavior that you appreciate, not in a self-serving way, but genuinely in a complimentary way, they pick up on the fact that that's something that you appreciate, and so they just do it more. Right, not like you're manipulating them to right. try and totally do it more. Right, totally not just, from a place of I'm manipulation. I'm acknowledging it. Yeah. Right. right, from a place of being genuine and sincere. True. Um, okay, practice non-judgmental listening. So as you get closer, if you're on date seven or beyond, you're going to be closer. I like you enough to see you more than five times. I kind of like you. There's something that's really here, which means that you're going to start to hear more things from me and they might be different and they might be not what you want to hear. And they might be something that might make you uncomfortable. And what I want to know is that when I speak, you're not going to judge me. I mean, we all have this tendency to judge, but when I say you're not going to judge me, you're not going to harshly negative judgely judge me and look at me. You can hear me. You can understand me. You don't have to, I don't need you to agree with me. I just want to know that I am safe to open up to you and to share something with you. So practice being a non-judgmental listener, which means it's not just non-judgmental with your listening. It means the words that come out of your mouth need to be non-judgmental and your facial expressions. So if somebody tells you something that is shocking to you, okay, and you're trying not to be judgmental because a shocking response would be judgmental, so you can't be like, oh, oh, really? Tell me more, right? <laughs> Those facial expressions do not work. You have to learn how to have a fabulous dating poker face. Your dating poker face looks like this. Somebody tells you something, you're like, oh, huh? Tell me more. I'm here. I'm listening. I'm curious. What's, what, what else is going on? You want to learn more. So you need your dating poker face. Um, 
We also want you, hold on a second, to be respectful and supportive. I think people know that, but we don't build each other up. Sometimes we try to help each other or bail each other out. Don't do that. Be respectful, be supportive, express yourself. And in terms of a relationship and intimacy, this is going to be my last topic here and then we're going to move on, is have a routine and break your routine. Okay. So if you normally go out on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights and whatever, and you normally this time you take a walk and that time you play games and you kind of have like your thing that you do, break it up, break up your, your routine. If you're somebody who's in a dating relationship and you're like all over the place, can we do this and we do that? And we do this and we do that. Like we don't really have a routine. No, no, no. You need some routine. You need to get into your groove because a couple that grooves together and has this something that we do, it becomes our thing. And you need things to become your thing, but you can't make it become your thing unless you get into the routine of making it happen. You got it? Got it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay. How's that? Should we stop there? Because I think I want to leave time for Q&A and I feel like this, this was a lot of info. So let's leave time for Q&A. Awesome. So before we jump into the Q&A, just going to ask you to just give you a quick reminder to drop your question in the Q and A box rather than the chat box. Do not put it in the chat box. Um, and we got a bunch of people who joined just about after 8.30. Um, so for all, of, um, for all of you who joined after 8.30, we had a little uh, disconnect between the flyer and Zoom. Um, so we started at 8, but if you missed Anything before you joined, fear not. The email with a replay of this webinar will go out on Sunday, God willing. All right. Okay, wait, Ready? let me just also say for anybody who popped on late, Adopt a Shadhan is the sponsor. Find them, learn about them. They're running Zoom dating events, they're connecting people. They even had an engagement through all this quarantine. It's really phenomenal. And just as a pitch, so you know, um, we work as dating and relationship coaches. I have a whole team of coaches. There are six of us. There's Aliza and there's a team with um, five other coaches that are here to support you. And we'll tell you about them at the end of the webinar, but just pop on. You can grab a free, free intro call. Interview us, get to know us. You want to know if you want to work with a dating coach, what we could do, why we could do it, how we could do it, how we could help you. Interview us. We would love to get to know you. You can even like while you're on here, click onto a new tab and go like, Free, click marriagemoneyventure.com and check out, check us out and grab a slot with one of our coaches. We would love to work with you. Awesome. All right. Aliza. Tell me. Um, I don't know if there is an answer for this, but what is the most important factor in emotional intimacy? Hmm. The most important factor. Consistency. How's that for on the spot answer? Thanks for not prepping, prepping me with that one. <laughs> um, in terms of emotional intimacy, you cannot run hot and cold, okay? If you run hot this week and we're connected and I'm feeling emotionally there and next week you are cold and there's something going on, that does not feel good. And then you're okay with me again and then you're not, like, I don't know what to expect with you. I'm not gonna know if we're gonna feel connected. We're not gonna feel connected. We are connected, we're not connected. And that doesn't feel right and that doesn't feel good to me. So please be consistent in building emotional intimacy. Okay. So I know in the past we've spoken about the fact that it's like 80, 20, when you're dating that 20% of the time, you just might not feel connected or it'll be awkward or whatever. So are you saying that yes. that's fine, but you should still show up and do your best and put in the effort. Um, and also if you're just feeling like you're having an off day, can you just voice that? Yeah, totally voice that. Cause that's emotional intimacy. Let me tell you about me. I'm kind of having an off day. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, the, so the question was, any advice for building emotional intimacy in early Zoom dates? But I think that the in-person and the Zoom stuff is pretty similar, right? You can still lean in. You can still lower your voice. Right. If you missed any of that in the beginning of the webinar, we talked about your tone and your speed and how, how quickly or how intimately you're talking and to pretend like you're talking where there's a table next to you and you're trying to build a connection just with that person without the whole room hearing you. Awesome. So we have a few different questions from people trying to understand the separation between, the question is how do we achieve emotional 
emotional intimacy if we can't touch. If we're dating Shomer Nagia, which means that we're not touching the opposite gender until we get married, how do we develop emotional intimacy? So could you talk a little bit about the separation between the two? Do they feed into each other? Are they totally separate? What do we need to know? Okay, love this question. First of all, if you can't build a relationship, an emotionally intimate relationship without physical touch, meaning you must have physical touch in order to build an emotional relationship, you're not really building an emotional relationship. Emotional relationships are built on an emotional connection. An emotional connection doesn't have to have a physical connection in order to have an emotional connection. So what I usually tell people, um, if they are not, if they are dating and they are physically touching in a relationship, I recommend you don't touch. You do what I call the five date rule where you, if you do engage in touching, you absolutely do not engage in touching for the first five dates, complete five dates it means so not until that date, date number five ends and date number six is a whole new brand new day, you know, like that's it. So the reason for that is if you don't have an emotionally connected relationship, it's not worth building a physical relationship because your brain is going to turn to mush and you're going to be confused. And then you might like them physically, but in terms of emotionally being connected, you're not going to be emotionally connected. You're going to want to or wish you would be, and then you're going to get a little bit confused. So I highly recommend building an emotional relationship first. And I don't think you need that physical side to do that. And if you don't know how to do that, then just listen to the beginning of the webinar. We gave you a whole bunch of tips. <laughs> awesome. Um, is there a limit to how much emotional intimacy you should develop during dating and prior to marriage? It's a good question. I do think that there has to be this slow progression of emotional intimacy. What I don't like to see is on a first date, you're emotionally intimate and you're like, what? we are so connected and then after that it's usually like crash and burn and everybody it's like fireworks like amazing gone you don't want amazing and gone emotional intimacy is something that is built slowly and consistently over the course of time and therefore we sorry repeat the question so i don't answer not answer it again um <laughs> i got i got there a a to, is there a limit to how a limit Missy, yeah, you should develop before marriage. Okay, so there are still things that should be, like, like there's, there's not, you shouldn't max out your emotional intimacy ever in life, okay? So there's not an amount that you could or couldn't or should or shouldn't develop before marriage. You should just consistently be building and connecting and you should know you're gonna get married and you're gonna keep connecting and going on for a lifetime. So you have to build in a way that sustains the relationship and feels good and healthy. If you are feeling completely drained or depleted, and in general you feel that way when you emotionally connect, you do have to push yourself to connect more because you're gonna naturally wanna not connect. If you are somebody that pushes to connect all the time and the other person's like, shh, 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 like I don't wanna talk right now. That don't want to emotionally connect. Don't want to, not every second has to be connected. So if you're an over connector, then you've got to cut back. So wherever you are on the spectrum, if you're on, you know, if you're a eight, nine, ten, or a one, two, three, you got to pull yourself in being somewhere more in the middle, middle ground. Awesome. Um, so we got a couple questions about developing emotional intimacy when with someone who's nervous or you're anxious or stuff like that. And I think that we address this. Um, specifically on the webinar about anxious daters and introverted daters. So um, just go check those out. All right, next question. What if, how can I promote vulnerability and self-disclosure with someone who is inexperienced or resistant to such a concept? It's kind of hard, isn't it? And you're like, oh, too bad because I kind of like these people, but I can't get close to them or I, I try to open up and then they don't want you to open up. Right. It's a little bit difficult. So I usually say you can only move as fast as the slowest, the person, slowest person, person in the relationship. Shazam, I'm a good student. That's <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. So if you are moving along in the emotional intimacy and they're like trailing behind you over here. You, you could be slightly ahead of them or you could try to match them and go together through it. If your pace is too far apart, it might just not be your partner. 
it's really possible that this is not the right person for you. And that might be a sign of I move like this, because could you imagine getting married to somebody and you're always moving like this and they're always playing catch up with you? It's really a problem, isn't it? It is a real big problem. So you need to value, don't ditch anybody in the beginning, give everybody a chance to see if something can work and something can happen. But it is common for people to be at different levels and try to match your levels and, and get similar, but you got the person who's ahead has to move behind and don't try to drag the other person along. They're gonna come along in their own time. Awesome. Um, how do you know that what you're feeling is an emotional connection? Close your eyes and then see where you feel it in your body. If you are feeling it here from your thinking, it is not an emotional connection. <laughs> if you think you're emotionally connected, you're not emotionally connected. You think you're emotionally connected. You hear it, right? An emotional connection happens here. It happens in the heart. It happens in the feeling center. It happens, it could be in, you know, the pit of your stomach, but it's like a warm and fuzzy feeling, but it is not going to be happening here. An emotional <laughs> connection happens elsewhere in in your body either in your gut or in your heart in this mm, to feel it to feel connected i don't I, I have a hard time putting words to this, this no so it's so hard. good i'm just laughing because we've had so many conversations about me thinking and mistaking thinking feeling for thinking and thinking for feeling and i've totally i've literally said this is how brainy i am i've said I wish I could explain to you in words how, how my heart feels. Like, I need you to understand it. Until <laughs> I right. And I'm like, yeah. no, there are no words to put to it. There's yeah. just a feeling yeah. that you have. Right. Right. Yeah. All right. Um, how do you, on the flip side, how can I not get attached to someone so quickly? so hard isn't it it's so hard not to get attached to somebody it's really it's difficult because on one hand if you don't get attached then you're not going to build emotional intimacy and if you do get attached then you're going to build it and then they might dump you and then you're going to feel sad about that the short answer you should work on being just a little more balanced so if you have one of those like oh my gosh <laughs> right if you have one of those personalities Bring yourself to the middle so that you're not so up there. We need you a little bit more with your feet on the ground in this world. Um, yeah, too attached. What's too attached? Too attached is I want to call you all the time and I can't call my friends to tell them instead. Too attached is I have to tell you everything. I don't have other people in my life to tell. You should have other people in your life that you could share things with and you don't have to share every single thought with this other human being. That's really it. All right. Um, what if you're not afraid of emotional intimacy, but you're unsure whether the other person is ready for the next step in emotional intimacy? Baby steps. Do what do you do? Baby steps. Teeny weeny, like dip your pinky toe in, try it. They don't respond so well, pull back. <laughs> try again the next date. If they don't respond so well, pull back. And just inch your way up and slowly build that relationship. All right. Um, so at the beginning, you talked about different levels of intimacy. You spoke about um, uh, intellectual intimacy, emotional intimacy, and experiential intimacy. If you only connect with on one level of intimacy, is that enough to know if the person that you're dating is the right one? Meaning, what if you don't connect intellectually, but emotionally you do? Well, isn't that like you? Is that like uh, your story? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think it works. Some people yeah. get engaged with that. Yeah. Uh, you have to know your, your strengths. So in terms of those three categories, you're going to be stronger in one, weaker in others. Some people are very balanced and might have, you know, kind of be middle of the road with all of them. Most people tend to have a key strength and kind of a secondary strength. And then the third one's usually really lacking. Um, I, uh, you can make it work. I, I mean, any... You got to pick some form of intimacy. We don't actually, to be honest by me, I don't care which form you like. Pick the one you like and work with it and make sure it's one that also works for your partner. Or if it doesn't work for your partner, like Sarah, so figure out 
if it actually does work for you. And if you're not sure how to do that, then call us for coaching and we'll talk you through it. It wasn't, by the way, Sarah's <laughs> story, it wasn't, sorry, it wasn't like, we just had two conversations and it was no big deal. It was no. several months of moving through this because it was the first time she experienced it and her brain was like freaking out. And she was like, no, right? And I was like, no, you're just feeling something. And she's like, I think I am. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you are. <laughs> Yeah, someone just someone just posted in the comments. If you found someone you connect with only intellectually, Mazel Tov, you found a great Havrusa. And I'm <laughs> laughing because um, the only person that I dated semi seriously before this one, and you know who I'm talking about, Aliza, we connected on an intellectual level like no one's business. We were great friends to the point where he came out to LA for Shavuos and we made plans to learn together Shavuos night because we're like, we'll be amazing Kavrusas. Like we would have had so much fun sitting over a Gemara together. <laughs> um, but there was no emotional connection. Right. Yeah. Right. All right. Um, is there a difference between emotional intimacy and romance? And if so, what's the definition of each? Emotional intimacy and romance. So emotional intimacy is intimacy and romance. I think romance. romance. <laughs> wow. Hold on. Hold on. Every, hold, on I want to give every, hold on. I want to give everyone a moment. To like, um, if I may, Aliza, I think yeah, romance yeah. is an expression or not an yeah. ex is an expression of and the behavior that leads to emotional intimacy. So romance comes from a place of emotional int intimacy and or leads to emotional intimacy. No? And, and some people have that romantic bone in their body. They're like, they're, they operate on romance and other people don't. It doesn't mean just because you don't have a romantic right. side that you won't get the emotional intimacy. You will. You won't get it through romance. You'll get it through intellectual or you'll get it through experiential. Right. But romantic people who love that, the cards and the flowers and the chocolates and the rose petals and whatever else you want to do that's creative and fun, they, they make your dreams come true like the movies. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Next one we've got Next is... One. Um, what if me and my date really hit it off in the beginning and then I open up, so some emotional intimacy there and it's not heavy, it's just personal stories and I'm sharing and I'm opening up and then they reject me. Worst nightmare. Yep, then you can do my dating detox and get through it. Um, what I'd like to tell, no, on a serious note is it happens. And, oh, sorry, I just came up with something. Hold on. I was working with a company. I got to pull out my computer for this one. <laughs> this is new. This is a new Elisaism, and you are going to like it, and it exactly addresses this. And if it doesn't, then you'll tell me I'm wrong. But hold on. Wait, wait, wait. I have to do this. <laughs> I have to tell you because I wrote it down because I was like, oh, I'm not going to get it. I don't want to, like, mess up what I'm going to say, but it exactly addresses this. Oh, of course, my computer's slow because I closed it. Hang on, everybody. Don't go anywhere. Oh, it's not doing it. Um, hang on. I, you have to hear it the way that I wrote it. And I just wrote it today. And I was like, this is a new Elisaism, but I didn't commit it to memory the way that it needs to be. But you're going to really like this in 30 seconds as soon as I pop it up here. It's an Elisaism. My ear, my headphones won't stay in tonight. It's super annoying. Okay, sorry to keep you all waiting. This is, this is real time. This is this is like <laughs> oh, rehearsed, recorded. Like, are your questions really answered? The answer is yes, they really are. And I have exactly what you need here, and it's going to pop up. And here it is in my lovely untitled document because I just pulled it together now, and it didn't even get a title on it. So, hold on. Okay. We're holding. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Tell me if you like it. It's new. If you don't like it, I'll trash it. Okay, ready? Everybody meets nobody until they meet somebody. That's what happens. Everybody meets nobody until they meet somebody. You're all going to meet a bunch of Mr. or Mrs. Nobodies. They're going to be nobody to you. You're going to date them and it's not going to work out and it's going to crash and burn. Every single time, everybody is going to meet nobody. You're all going to meet nobody, 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 until you actually meet somebody. 
Okay. Nobody, not meaning you're not meeting any people, nobody, meaning nobody important to you, nobody that you're going to get emotionally connected to, or nobody that's going to get emotionally connected to you. You're going to be putting out your effort. You're going to be putting your heart and soul and your kishkas into something. You're going to really work so hard at this. And then they're going to turn into a nobody. And you're going to be like, Aliza, but it's enough already. I met a million nobodies and I don't want to meet any more nobodies. I want to meet somebody. And you are going to meet somebody. But the dating process goes like this. You meet a bunch of nobodies until you finally meet somebody and you marry them and then you're done. And so we have to go through this. This is just the annoying, irritating, frustrating process of dating and relationships. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I tell people if this was easy, I wouldn't be, I, we wouldn't be having this conversation right now. If dating was easy, if this never happened, this happens all the time to everybody because everybody needs nobody until they need somebody. All right. Do you like it? I said it like six times. Yeah. Like <laughs> it. Good. <laughs> um, I, I, I want to know from everybody else, put in, put in the comments if you like it, because if you don't, I won't say it again. <laughs> um, while you're doing that, I will get to the next question. Um, often I compliment the girl as a way to gain intimacy, but I've experienced times where the girl just doesn't respond in kind. She will respond by nonchalantly saying thank you, but without any real emotion. And this can be very frustrating. What advice can you give me on this? Can I just Dump throw one No. Whoa, wait, what? <laughs> go, go, go. I'm kidding. Um, I don't know who you are or what your background is, but I can definitely say in the more right-wing Orthodox communities, um, girls are not experienced in accepting compliments from the opposite gender. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't appreciate it. They just might not know what to do with it. Um, and that's not okay. It's just the reality that is just just something to keep in the back of your mind right and i think in general men and women sometimes have a hard time accepting compliments connecting building an emotional relationship i would tell you to slow it down again match her pace so if you're moving at a certain pace and she's not catching up or catching on try to slow it down and take even smaller steps to see if you can actually build something if it starts to happen and you're able to build something, great. If it doesn't end up turning into something, then you made your best effort. If you're constantly finding this, then you need to start dating people that are, you need to put in your dating profile, I'm looking for somebody who's emotionally available or somebody who has IQ and EQ. I need intellectual intelligence and I also need emotional intelligence. And, and I would, I would just recommend that you look into that because if you're getting the same types, maybe we need to shift who and what you're looking for. And I just want to add one more comment as I used to be that person who would nonchalantly say thank you and move on. Um, two, two things that popped to mind to me. Number one, I've worked on myself to not always, oops, Aliza, we lost your video. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to throw a host back to you. Um, number one, I've worked on myself to intentionally not always respond with a, not always respond to a compliment with a compliment. Um, because that is something that we've been trained to do that isn't necessarily always a good thing. Like it's okay for me to just accept a compliment, at least your host. And the second thing is, I do think it's also a defense mechanism um, to a certain degree because we're taught that, you know, men are supposed to compliment women. Like, so if someone would tell me you look beautiful, I take it and I say, thank you. But in my, my brain automatically goes to, and this is an insecurity, but I know that it's an insecurity that many women have. My brain goes to, oh, he's supposed to say that. Or like, I don't know if he really thinks I'm beautiful. He's just saying that because he's supposed to. I think I just repeated myself. Um, so I don't know what kind of compliments you're giving, but maybe try think, try noticing things that the average person wouldn't notice or try complimenting things that are not standard compliments um, because it's a lot more, it's intimate. It's a lot more intimate when someone says to me, um, I don't know, when someone notices that I'm a conscientious, 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 driver versus you have a really nice smile. Like I like my smile, but everyone compliments my smile, right? Um, if someone takes the time to notice something that I'm doing or saying or am that's not standard, it's, a, it's gonna get a very different kind of thank you from me. Um, on that note, 
um, because we discussed this, the point you mentioned about verbally identifying what you know about them, which may make them do it more, isn't that a bit counterproductive? So I just want to say I threw in the comment about do I noticed that the more like when you do that, they say it more. That wasn't Aliza's point. Aliza was just talking about in terms of building emotional intimacy, it's complimenting. Um, I want to know who he is and what he's planning on the rest of doing the rest of his life not necessarily what he's gonna hyper, be hyper aware of during the short dating period because I spelled it out for him. Right, so the thing is that people do not stick with things unless it really is who they are and what they are. People have a really hard time putting on a show for an amount of time. Maybe it'll happen just for that date, but on the next one or the third one, like after that, it's going to disappear if it's not yeah. really genuinely who somebody is. Also, if you're going to expect a partner to be a mind reader or just know what you want without ever having to tell them or say anything or connect, or they're just going to get it. Some people are great. Some people are intuitive. Some people really get people and get things. Other people are not. If they are not intuitive, they are never going to get it. So you either need to marry somebody intuitive or you have to share who you are and what you want and what you like and how they can be there to support you. And you have to teach them about you, not teach them how to behave for you, help them to learn about you so that they can do the right things to put a smile on your face. Awesome. And I just, we got in a comment um, from the last question, someone just saying, if a girl is uncomfortable with the closeness of a compliment, so if it's a very intimate compliment, um, she might brush it off with a thank you. And it doesn't mean it's not appreciated. She's just trying to ease the discomfort that that created. Because Thank of you. Spot on. Thank you. Yeah. That was a way better way of explaining that. <laughs> We're um, teamwork. It's you, it's me, and it's all of you. We work together to get it. the right words out. Love it. Love it. Um, can you have a strong, intimate relationship if you don't have everything or if you don't have a lot in common for what you like to do? So then it's not going to be an experiential intimacy. You would eat, and if you're not learning or have an intellectual thing, so you don't have those things in common, you would have to just have an emotional intimacy, which is a heart intimacy, which is a warmth intimacy, a connection intimacy. It's just, you're somebody who's safe to be around. You're comfortable to be around. You're easy to be around. You're pleasant to be around. We just heart to heart connect. Uh, you won't be able to connect on the other two levels so much. So you need a heart person. Awesome. Um, so again, at the beginning of the webinar, we discussed the different intimacies and you put aside physical, uh, you put aside sexual intimacy, and then you made a comment before about the difference between developing emotional intimacy outside of a physical relationship. Um, so we just have someone asking, is it wrong according to Judaism to have sexual intimacy? So could you just take a minute to talk about why we put that aside for now? Okay. So in according to Torah Judaism, we save physical sexual intimacy for marriage. The way really to a very big and intentional part of the relationship. Correct. And we also observe certain customs and laws about our physical intimacy, even through marriage. So it's not just like, oh, fine, we save it for marriage. And then we just have, do whatever we want, whenever we want. It's also not true. There are times when a couple has sexual intimacy in the marriage and there are times when they don't, when they completely physically separate. And if you look in, you know, there's Judaism and then there's secular wisdom also. And if you look in secular wisdom and psychology and all sorts of research studies, you will find that couples who observe distances and times of coming together physically and times of staying apart. Those are the marriages that last the longest, maintain the healthiest relationships and are able to grow over the course of time. Having just unlimited access to everything you want all the time, believe it or not, it doesn't make people happy. It doesn't keep them married longer. It doesn't make intimacy better. It actually helps to have absence makes the heart grow fonder and have a distance and, and have a separation. In terms of a physical intimacy um, in dating and relationships, so yes, um, Torah Judaism prescribes that we don't have physical intimacy as a part of our relationship. And by me, I grew up secular. I became observant in my mid-20s and I even before I was observant, I was reading books and learning all about how sex and relationships don't need to go hand in hand to find the right person. Actually, with having physical intimacy, you could actually find out if you like the human being that you're going to live with for the rest of your lives, because a sexual relationship will be one part of your relationship. It is not the whole component of your relationship. You will spend how many more hours being 
with that human being in life compared to being in the bedroom with that person. So we really need to know that we like this whole complete human being as a human being, as a brain, as a heart, as a body, as an experiential person in the world. I need to know that you like me and I like you and there's something here and we don't need physical intimacy for that. Um, physical intimacy is something that comes and, and it's really for, it's for holiness. It's for the highest physical connection in this world. And even if you're like, oh, but I want to have that now because we want to see if it's going to work and if it's going to be okay. It's not the same. When you get married, the physical intimacy that a married couple has is the highest, most complete form of a physical intimacy and coming together. You do that before you get married. It's not. It's completely the opposite. So it's not, it's not going to actually tell you the information that you think you need to know. If you want to talk more about that, we could sign up and really dig into it. Uh, but there's I feel like we should have a webinar about it. this. Just throwing it out as me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we should. We should. We should do it. Yeah, you on board? Everybody yeah, wants totally, it. Totally. Totally. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Sold. <laughs> okay, this one, I think might be my favorite of the night, but not, not that it matters. <laughs> you love every question. Stop telling everybody that. This is not our favorite one. It's Don't even so believe true. it. Every time it's she's so like, this, I love this question. This is a good one. <laughs> They're all good. They're all good. Um, does my marriage need to be the most emotionally intimate relationship that I have? Ooh. Right? Shazam. Okay, I'm going to, this is, this is the sound of me thinking. You're going to hear nothing. Yes. Yes. This is the person that you have the potential to be the most completely connected to physically, emotionally, spiritually. We come into this world. We have an attachment to our parents. We have an attachment to our children, but our spouse is somebody that we choose, that we bind our soul to, that we are one soul with. And therefore we should be the most emotionally intimate and connected with this person. I'm not going to say every single day. I'm not going to say every single month. You know, some moments I feel more connected to my best friend than my husband, or I feel better with my parents than my sibling or something. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. And the ideal relationship is that you have the greatest intimacy. I mean, except, oh, wait, wait, that exception. There's always an exception to the rule. You need to have an emotionally intimate relationship between you and the creator and sustainer of the world, God. Okay. And you need to have an emotionally intimate relationship with you and yourself. You, you've got to have a connection and yes, with yourself. It is the most, it is the most, uh, whatever, whatever the word was, um, emotionally intimate relation, interpersonal relationship. How's that? Yeah. Great. So <laughs> great. Okay. Great question. Thank you. Um, so I actually have a follow-up question to that because at the beginning of this conversation, we spoke yep. about, again, the different intimacies, and you made a comment that, just using my case as an example, I thought I needed intellectual intimacy, um, and I realized that I didn't. Emotional intimacy was much more important for me, but you said that you did realize that, uh, that, that for some couples, they, they did create a relationship built off of intellectual intimacy as their foundation or experiential intimacy as their foundation. But I'm curious if you would say the same thing. Like if I ask you, does your, does your marriage have to be the most intellectually intimate relationship you have, would you say yes? And if I ask you, does your marriage have to be the most experiential relationship, you know, would you say yes? And if not, then why is emotional the intimacy different? Yeah. Oh, you really dig in. Okay. <laughs> So glad we rehearsed this, Sarah, because this question didn't come up. <laughs> By the way, you should know everything live is like live, live. Like these are just new, fresh questions coming in from you guys. Okay, nothing is rehearsed here. So yeah, there is something, there is a different level of intimacy. I, you know, I don't, can I, maybe can we get back to them on the follow-up email? Because I want to, I would rather sit with this and ponder this. There's not like a poof, magical answer that I have off the tip of my tongue. Um, somebody should write that question down and on my team. Um, if, 
we're going to say that emo I'm going to just talk it out with you. Here's here you're going to hear my thinking. If we're saying emotional intimacy, yes, you should have that strongest with your partner, although not every single day, every single moment, but in general, that is the greatest person that you have that connection with. Then I would expect if your form of intimacy is intellectual, then yeah, you need to have that partner be the strongest person for you in the same way because that's your strongest close type of intimacy. But I'm, I'm going to cut you off for a second because yeah. part of the reason I had such a hard time dating people who weren't intellectually intimate is because all of my friends are. I don't do well with people who aren't brainiacs or people who aren't deep thinkers, right? It's not that I'm not friendly. I have a lot of friendlies, but my friends, the people who are close to me in my life are all the intellectual type because that's what I'm attracted to and that's what I connect with, right? Right. So which was why I went into dating, making that same assumption. Right, but then you shifted and had an aha. That, right, you had that aha, though, that I need the, the, mid, I need the emotional intimacy, not the intellectual intimacy. And in the marriage. He, in the marriage. I'm, I'm still assuming... going to attract the same kind of friends, though, right? But in terms of emotional intimacy, there's going to be nobody else in the world that you have that greater connection with than him. Correct. But I'm an intellectual person. So I, this is a little, it's a little bit like nuanced and like, but if I am this, but I go for that, but what if I'm not that, what if I am this and I go for this? And, uh, I think we're getting a little too nuanced, but I like the line of thinking and I like the line of questioning. And I think if you have any specific questions or you really want to work through this personally, whomever you are out there in the world wide web, um, we would love to work with you on this. It's, I think so the bottom line is whichever one is most important to you in a relationship that needs to be the strongest, the met your marriage needs to be the strongest form of that intimacy. Most consistently. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Next. Um, <laughs> some people who have a fear of intimacy come from the more avoidant attachment styles. Do you know of cases where couples do you know of cases of couples where this was involved that were able to make the relationship work and what helped with that? Mm. Yeah, I have to think about like, I have to think about case studies and, and specifically what works for people. I don't know that I could give you a generic answer because I think each couple had to figure out for them what worked and it's a little bit unique because there's, there's like there's, it's not a generic it's, it's not generic enough of a question for me to give you an answer it's too nuanced and too specific and too detail oriented to each style type of person there's like a there's a lot of factors that are going on here so I don't actually want to give you a generic answer to that sorry it's a, it's a good question it's it's just too, <laughs> no it's just it it's too it's too nuanced it, a lot of the there's time, no general have, answer. There's basically. no general, not not for me at least. Maybe maybe somebody else could give you a general answer, but for me, I don't think that that's a uh, a general answer kind of question. Most of the questions that I that we go through, I can answer and give you a general answer to, but I don't have one for that. All right, let's see if you can give one for this one. What advice <laughs> can you give someone who's very emotionally in tune and loves to emotionally connect, but okay. whose date has the potential to be, but just a, but just doesn't know how to be. Has the potential, right. So having the potential, but not actually doing it are two different things. Um, if you don't know how to, if they don't know how to do it, I don't want you to burn out trying to teach them how to do it. You really need to mirror it. You need to show them what and do it, you know, with them for them and then hope that they respond in kind and they do it with you for you. If they're not catching on or they're hesitant, you could wait a little bit longer. Give the dating process, if you'd normally dump them after two dates, if they're not really showing up, wait four dates to actually dump them and see if you could draw it out. Give them more time to catch up if you see the potential. Um, it can be that people need to work through this on their own before they go dating or you need to put dating on pause and they need to figure it out. Or it can be they just needed a little nudge and a little guidance from somebody. I have a lot of clients that are like, Lisa, I wish somebody would just draw it out. I've got so much to share. I've got so much to say, but I need somebody to pull it out of me. Even with me, when they work with me, they're like, ask me questions. 
And I said, I can, and I will, and I do, but I also want you to be able to open up. I want you to be able to share, and I want you to be able to do this without me having to draw it out of you because it's exhausting for the other person in the relationship. So I want to train them how to do it on their own. Um, so I would tell you to try, try and give it twice as long is what I would say and, and have mirror by doing it, for, doing it yourself and then having them do it with you. Awesome. Um, so we actually got a request for attachment styles to be a potential webinar. Okay. Um, Throw it down. All right. Um, I'm going to our 931. So I'm going to finish off with a question that not, that is not specifically this related, but I'm sure it's a question um, that will resonate with many um, viewers. So if you are an older single and have been in the shit up system waiting for your spouse for many years, it can be shit off system is the orthodox way of dating. Um, it can be hard when meeting someone, even if they're great, because there's this nagging feeling of if you're my perfect match and I've been ready for marriage for so many years, why did you make me wait so long? How can we overcome that? Yeah, I've heard, why did you make me wait so long? Or what's wrong with you? Why aren't you married? Wait, what's wrong with me? Why am I not married? I don't <laughs> like any of those questions. Why did you make me wait so long? So it's the wrong question. There's a book, it's called Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. Check it out. The question you should be asking is, if you're asking about why did somebody wait, make you wait so long, ask why God made you wait so long. Ask why you were single this long. Ask yourself, what did you accomplish during this time period? Ask yourself, who did you become during this time period? You're just focusing on the wrong thing. If you're my person, you're my person. If, if they weren't ready, you can't get married. If you're, if you're ready and you're like, I'm ready, let's go. And the other person's like, not there yet, not there yet, not there yet. And you're waiting and you're waiting and you're waiting. And all of a sudden, poof, they're ready. Okay, now it's your moment because you're both ready. You have to both be ready. If you're not both ready, it's just what it is. It's, it's a timing thing. I assume and hope, and if not, you're going to do it. You're becoming who you need to be. You're going to be somebody who's fabulous, who's interesting, who's engaging, who's doing something in the world, who's passionate, who is figuring things out, who is learning or growing or experiencing things. You are going to be somebody in this world who is somebody with your soulmate and without your soulmate. It's not just when your soulmate comes along, oh, poof, now I can actually do my life. Do your life and find your soulmate and do your life together. So don't be thinking about what'd you make me wait for so long. He's going to be saying, or she's going to be saying, what'd you make me wait for so long? It's you. You, were, you weren't ready. Finally, your head is open. You're in a space. You're like, no, no. I was like, don't get caught up in all of that. It's just time to meet. It's time to greet. It's time to schmooze. And it's time to get emotionally intimate. And from that, then you can build a relationship and, and find your person, not find your person, be with your person and move on. Awesome. All right. So I am going to close out the questions. I'm just going to remind you that um, a lot of the questions that were asked that we didn't have time to get to or weren't relevant to this topic specifically were answered in previous webinars. So go to the um, events page, see which one um, lines up with your question because they're pretty um, specific in what the webinar was about uh, and watch it. Aliza? <laughs> okay, so I want to say thank you again to our amazing sponsor, Adopt a Shadchan. They are out there helping people. They have been doing virtual dating events for the past couple of months and they have been super successful. They even have an engagement during quarantine. Hooray! Mazel tov. And there's lots of people that are dating. So check out Adopt a Shadchan. I also want to say to everybody who's here, take one minute right now, go to marriagemindandmentor.com and click on get a free introduction call. Interview us. There are six amazing coaches and we are all available and here to support you. So you could work with me. You can work with Alana Brown. She's in Toronto. She works with clients all over the world. She's a matchmaker and a therapist. And with us, she works as a coach and she's phenomenal. She loves to do really deep, meaningful work. You can work with Shira Alt. She also has a therapy background. She works with us as a coach. She is in Ohio and she has been working with clients of all ages and all stages. And she loves to dig in. If you're in a relationship and you're trying to gain clarity, or if you're trying to move through something and you just you want to work with her and, and figure it out, she works with men and women of all ages. Also, Michael who's in Philly with me. He works with men and women of all ages. Um, also has a marriage and family therapy counseling background, works with us as a coach, 
and he gets people. He just, you know, he understands people and he helps people move through the dating process, specifically with emotional intimacy or things of this nature. He is excellent with these things. So you should definitely sign up with him if that interests you. If you are a woman and you're in your 20s and 30s and you are looking for somebody who is phenomenal, you should sign up with Reagan. Reagan's specialty is note taking on your session. She will go through everything and you won't just get off the call and you'll be like, oh, that was a good call. Like, yeah, I had a session. You are going to get a summary email with all of the notes from the session. She outlines what you spoke about. She details what you're working on, what you're doing, any homework. And you walk away with like, it's like a Megillah. You get so much information. It's phenomenal. She only works with women in their twenties and thirties. That is her specialty area. Um, and you should sign up with Reagan if that interests you. And last but not least, we have Leia. Leia is in Israel and her specialty is personality analysis. And she does either a 90 minute session, or if you want to break it up, she'll do two 45 minute sessions. And she works with you from a Torah perspective to tell you about your personality, which you know about, but to describe it in other language and to describe who and what would be good for you, why you should date this type of person. You could also analyze previous people that you dated that didn't fit that, that mold of what she's explaining to you, what might be good for you and how to figure out how to find that person that you want to work with. So that is our team. And I am Aliza Ben Shalom. You can work with me. I work with singles of all ages and stages. My specialty is older singles. To some people that means like 27 and to some people that means 57. It doesn't really matter your age or your stage. My specialty is helping singles get over their hurdles and under the chuppah. I love working with people. My favorite, to be honest, I do one session here and there, but my favorite is actually to have clients who are interested in working together for three months or six months um, with a commitment of working together on a regular basis because that's how I can best help you get over your hurdles and under the chuppah. So just sign up. It's a complimentary session. Get to know us work with us. We've had tremendous success with singles from all over the globe and we would really love to help you. That is my spiel. One last thing I'm just going to add before Aliza signs us off. Um, you should be getting, you will get this email on Sunday, God willing. They have been going out the last few weeks. So saw a few comments about people saying that they haven't received them. Try checking your spam. If you're still not seeing it, feel free to reach out to us so we can double check that everything's matching up properly. Um, if you by any chance unsubscribed at some point, you will not getting, be getting those emails. <laughs> never. You'll never get them if you unsubscribe. <laughs> we can't add you back on if you don't want to. <laughs> um, all righty. Aliza. I think we're doing great. Okay. So I'm going to end with a bracha, a blessing for you. My blessing is that you should find somebody that you enjoy being in their company and that you should be able to open up in the right time to the right person and build an emotionally intimate and connected, deeply beautiful relationship. Amen. Alrighty. Awesome. Signing off. Love you guys. Thanks for coming. Your host. Oh, I'll okay. end the webinar. <laughs>